Thank you, everybody. It is such an honor to be able to be your keynote speaker. Sorry, water. Okay, well, I always go around saying, oh, cooperatives are going to change the economy. And then when I had a nice phone conversation with Matt a few weeks ago, I started to think maybe just one cooperative could change the economy. Let me think, like, could a food cooperative make such a huge impact? So maybe it can. Let's see. Um, so I also draw cartoons because I like to visualize what a better world will look like. So here you go. Um, so the economy, that's a big subject. So I'm just going to focus on one little piece of it, which is bread. Um, so if you ever wonder where your food comes from, you know, it turns out to be really hard to find out when you want to figure out, okay, who owns this company? You find out that a bigger company owns that and another one owns that. And, and it can be very hard, but one thing I finally figured out is that all of those brands that I had up there just now are only two companies. Uh, these two gigantic corporations own a really substantial part of the bread that we eat in this country. So these 14 brands, just two companies. Um, and you know, if you were to think about every dollar you spend as a really cute car a cartoon with emotions, who is very sensitive about what you do with it. I mean, you know, people are motivated to spend consciously for different reasons, and I'm very motivated by imagining my dollar is going to get mad at me. And so if you ask a dollar, well, what would you think if I went and bought Wonder Bread with you? What would that dollar think? That dollar might say, oh, ooh, I'm not feeling so good. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I know this is in bad taste. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, you know, maybe that'll be memorable. And so, you know, if I spend one dollar buying Wonder Bread in my community, which is Oakland, California, maybe some of that dollar will stay in my community, as you can see, a few pennies are staying. But the dollar is going to go off to these companies, which are largely owned by shareholders, and the shareholders are a fairly small sector of society. So, this is what your dollar would rather be doing. It would rather be playing Berkshire pinball. And what is that? Well, if you put a dollar into the Berkshire economy, and the first place you spend it, I, I, got, I took a lot of photos in the store today. Uh, so first place you spend it is at, uh, to buy some Hosta Hill tempeh. Well, that dollar just bounced. It didn't really leave the community. It just moved to a different part of the community. And if Hosta Hill patronizes a lot of local businesses and, and employs local employees, then that dollar is very likely to bounce again. And you know, with pinball, the whole goal is to just not let that ball leave. Don't let that dollar leave. As long as you can keep it bouncing around, it's going to raise your score. So your score, your local wealth, is going up and up. So if I buy, um, oh, what is this called? You know what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> Dan took me there today. That was very nice. So yeah, you can just keep bouncing that dollar around in the community infinitely. And um, you know, you all have a, a special advantage in the game of Berkshire Pinball <laughs> because you created a currency that can't leave. Look, it can't even go down. So, <laughs> so you're going to score really big if you keep using that. So. Um, so when, one reason it's an honor to be here is so many models that I talk about in my work, I'll point to the Berkshire currency or, you know, things that happen in this region. So it's exciting to be here. But in any case, you know, I, I used to not be so motivated by this idea of, oh, let's keep wealth local. I mean, yeah, we can grow local wealth, but what about the rest of the world? Don't they need wealth? And then I realized why, the other reason why we shouldn't let that ball go down the slot or let the dollar leave the community is because most of the time it does go to people who already have money. Normally it's not going to people who need money elsewhere so much, but um, it goes to the owners of the corporations, the shareholders of the corporations, the people who could afford to invest their assets. So, and then you get this. This is the distribution of wealth in the United States where 20% of people control 93% of the wealth and I mean, the more horrifying part is, okay, 80% of people really are just working with 7% of the wealth. I mean, we should just be that shocked about it every day. Um, and so, so, yeah, part of the answer is small local business. But then it brings up the question of how are we going to keep these small local businesses from just being swallowed up later on, like when the owners want to retire? It would be very tempting to just sell to a bigger company. So, 
here's where cooperatives come in. Um, and you know, it's not just about cooperatives. It's, it's a whole economic system that basically causes this to happen. Maybe Thomas's English Muffins was a small company at some point, but no more. So, so here's a bread, a grain mill, uh, representing our economic and legal system. And this is how we make bread. Uh, we have all these inputs like water, land, seeds, and so on. Uh, we have people who do the work, consumers who put in the money. We sprinkle on a lot of pesticides. And then over here we have a shareholder elected board that's basically behind the wheel steering the company. And they crank things around uh, to generate profits for themselves. And they, over time, they gain power and money. And one of the reasons why this has been just fine for so long is because the rest of us get jobs and food, which are things that we need. And so for a long time, it was kind of working. Like, we got jobs and food. OK, they're getting a little power, a little money. But now they've gotten quite a bit of money. Um, oh, so I'm a lawyer. I do a lot of work around the, the legal needs of creating a new economy. One, here's a little legal history. Is in the Constitution, we have this idea of freedom of contract, which is kind of this notion that we should be able to go forth and create private relationships with one another and contract with one another for our economic transactions and freely do so. But then around the Depression, Congress and the Supreme Court started to notice what was happening. They were thinking, OK, there's these there people working in factories. They're working long hours. They're unhealthy. Okay, we can't let this system just go completely unchecked. So they said, that thing in the Constitution, we're going to have to alter that just a little bit, the way we interpret it. So uh, we got the Fair Labor Standards Act and a whole lot of other employment laws, which are basically just tightening bolts in the system to prevent complete exploitation. It kind of slows the extraction of labor and resources. And we got securities laws, which protect investors from putting their money into fraudulent or overly risky schemes. We got health and safety laws, consumer protection laws. We also got zoning laws, because we noticed that if you put a giant smelly factory next to people's residences, it's not a good outcome. So we separated out the functions of our lives through zoning. One thing that's important to note is even with all these laws, and there's a lot of laws, we still don't have a great situation. That's me 15 years ago working at Olive Garden. Darden Restaurants is the biggest full service chain. They still do not give paid sick time to most of their employees. And they still, in states where it's possible, like Ohio, pay only $2.13 an hour for tipped employees. And that's while they have one half billion dollars in profits a year. That's a half billion dollars they could have invested in their workers, but they don't. So you know, the system's just not working out for a lot of people. So that's why a lot of people say, let's create a totally new system. And this, this list is kind of the list of clients that I serve in the Bay Area. And then this is a list of things that are also in your community as well. Um, when people come together from the grassroots and start to create these innovative projects, uh, something happens. Um, so, well, here's an imaginary food cooperative. This is a baby cooperative. Say 400 people get together, and they rent a small warehouse space and start purchasing food in bulk. And they each agree, we're going to volunteer three hours per month each. We're each going to invest $500. Um, and we're, yeah, we're going to use this warehouse or maybe somebody's garage space in a neighborhood, whatever it might be. Look what happens when they try to turn the wheel. They can't turn it. It's stuck. And it's because we've tightened up the regulations so much. But, um, and you know, one of the reasons they can't turn it is employment laws don't really allow you to volunteer, even for your own food cooperative in many cases. And securities laws don't allow them, oh, I had slides on that. Securities laws don't allow them to invest even $500 in their own cooperative. And health and safety laws might prevent them from using a warehouse space for storing food. And maybe zoning laws will really prevent them from um, freely choosing where they locate their cooperative. So, so many barriers. But the big question is, well, how could we even loosen any of these barriers when we live in an economic system that's so extractive, that has so many incentives to exploit people and to exploit the environment? It's very dangerous to loosen those. So actually, it turns out it's really just a flawed economic system, and we only need to change two little things about it. Um, and then maybe we can adapt the laws a little bit. So we change who's in charge and who's getting the profits. And so, we, so now we have, OK, put different people in charge. We'll have a board of directors elected by the consumers or the workers or both. 
and we'll have any profits distributed back to them, not on the basis of how much money they had the privilege to invest, but how much they actually contributed in value through participation. So that circulates and recirculates the wealth in a community, first of all. Um, you know, cooperatives. The thing about cooperatives is that word has so much baggage. You know, everybody thinks it's, oh, it's all these people having long, inefficient meetings and getting into fights with each other. And actually, at the, I'm staying at Briarcliff Hotel, Motel, which is lovely, and I met somebody from Bakersfield, California this morning, and we were talking about cooperatives, and she thought, oh, I just thought cooperatives were those places with bulk bins. You know, so some people don't really know very much about cooperatives at all. It's important to be reminded about that. And so, and if you ask anybody what is a cooperative, you get all kinds of answers. So I like to boil it down to this. Cooperatives are businesses in which money cannot buy power and money cannot buy profits because they're democratic and they distribute profits based on patronage. So money doesn't buy power, money doesn't buy profits. What an ingenious, innovative concept. What is that called? Oh, democracy. Uh, you know, it's, it's just weird that we've, we've sort of in, intended to build a country based on similar principles, but not really thought about building our livelihoods and our consumption and production based on that. So cooperatives, very powerful. And they don't continue to grow the wealth of the people who already have more than enough. They circulate wealth. And when, as I mentioned, it just when you circulate and recirculate wealth, in one community, it grows that wealth. And so compare these two different systems. We have a generative business structure that's basically designed to provide for and protect and nourish community members, and it's um, providing jobs and providing food with no real incentive to exploit people and, and so on. Um, and then compare that to this extractive system, which really has so many incentives to just take as much as it can. So when you compare those side by side, that's the legal wedge. Uh, so we do have a whole legal system that's designed for these very market-based extractive structures, and we can create additional legal frameworks for cooperatives and other entities that are basically designed to provide for and nourish communities. So that's when we could begin to loosen some of these bolts, not for typical businesses, but maybe for cooperatives, so the moral to the story, just to make it memorable, is cooperatives. And it's not just that they're going to change the economy. It's uh, that we can't change the legal system without them. And truthfully, we can't change the economy unless we change the legal system. And it's all very intertwined. So, um, OK, but now we have this question. How, how do you get cooperatives started? How are they even going to compete in this economy where it's just easier to buy the cheaper stuff? So I think that we could eventually get to a tipping point. Because right now, they're trying to form a cooperative is very hard. You have so much going against you, maybe the first of which is most people don't really even understand what cooperatives are. So we need to grow cooperative literacy. We need to ensure there's legal services for cooperatives and financing and all of these things. But as we begin to build these things, I think we will get to a tipping point where forming a cooperative is, is the obvious thing to do. Um, and maybe one awesome food cooperative could even contribute substantially to getting us to that tipping point. And let's see, in what ways might a cooperative do that, a food cooperative? Well, aside from being a grocery store, a food cooperative is, uh, it serves many other roles and functions. And here's how those might be used. Well, um, a food cooperative, food cooperative is, has power as a buyer, not just buying products for the member owners, but also buying services and products for the cooperative itself. So, um, you know, if the board is sitting around trying to figure out, oh, you know, what kind of aprons and linens should we buy? Well, somebody might say, well, let's get it from this gigantic international corporation because it's cheaper. And that's what, you know, MBAs are really trained to do. That's how we're trained to a lot of us to think. Um, but, you know, another board member could find it very legitimate in that moment to bring up the fact that the co-op's dollars are not going to be very happy about that. <laughs> um, and maybe even bring up the pinball game. Remind, you know, um, Berkshire Pinball um, really ultimately benefits the same member owners of the cooperative and the community in which the cooperative lives. So, um, you know, maybe spending some extra money on aprons and supporting a local cooperative will ultimately benefit and bring more wealth to everybody in the end. Um, and by the way, somebody should create an app for that. Like hackers, accountants, you might even be able to figure out how to actually track how much 
wealth you are multiplying in your community by buying from local businesses, and especially local businesses that also buy from local businesses, and so on. Um, I, I noticed you have these great local labels. Uh, here's what it could look like if you actually, you know, you guys might not actually do this, but you know, um, sometimes you buy from a local business, but it, you know, they might be exploiting their workers and not paying them very well. They might be getting all their supplies from overseas. Who knows? So, so yeah, that, that information is very relevant. How much are they spending locally and so on. Um, I also learned that you're helping to support a cashew cooperative in El Salvador, that anytime you buy from Equal Exchange and the cooperative, the cooperative and Equal Exchange donate 2% to help this cashew cooperative get started in El Salvador. So it's, it's not about just the local economy because we live in a global economy. We rely on the global economy. Um, we definitely couldn't eat cashews if it weren't for that global economy. So, so I think that's a really amazing way in which this cooperative is using its power. Um, oh yeah, there's the, the sign in the store that's about that next to the coffee. So the other thing is, yeah, cooperatives make choices about what to buy for uh, the member owners. And, you know, maybe the cooperative will start making decisions to even buy from other businesses that are cooperatively structured, you know, just try to get it cooperatively structured all the way down the line. But, you know, if you, if you fill the shelves with a certain product, you can't necessarily guarantee that customers are going to buy it. Um, and even, you know, if a new business comes along and they're really awesome, you can't even necessarily guarantee that people are going to patronize it. They might think, oh, that's cool, and, you know, we should go there, but it's not something the business can completely rely on. So here's the second way in which the food cooperative is powerful. It's a, it's a convener. It brings people together. It builds community, and there's so many other initiatives you can organize collectively. And it could be member-led initiatives. It could be board-led initiatives, but I'll give you an example which is, okay, let's say a new bakery forms and they're going to be owned by the workers and you really want it to survive. Even before it opens, you could see how many owners you could get to commit to buying one loaf per week because if a baker were to know that they were going to have a whole group of people each buying one loaf per week for a year, then they're guaranteed success. They know that they're going to be able to make a go of this and that's going to give people the courage to take risks and to form businesses that are more innovative for the community. So forming agreements can be a very powerful thing. This is the underlying um, idea of community-supported agriculture in its sort of purest form, which I think originated here. So, uh, and even businesses before they start, what if they got 500 of these commitments? They would have a much easier time getting um, bank loans, um, leases, and so many other things that new businesses struggle to obtain. So the cooperative can convene people. Uh, they might not even convene people to buy products from the cooperative. It could be separately, but just that power to collectively organize people. Uh, here's my personal project. is um, I'm trying to only buy locally made clothes, which in the Bay Area is getting a little bit easier. Uh, by the way, these are California made. A um, little fashion show for you. But, um, so yeah, I, I ask a lot of questions when I go and buy my clothes now, and even you know, as far down as like, where did the cotton come from? But um, maybe we could all start playing this game, especially if you want to cultivate a new manufacturing industry locally. If we were all to start, do th start doing this, people would have the confidence to grow apparel industries, for example. Um, but if you really want to up your game, if I really want to up my game now, I'm thinking I should only buy from cooperatives because even these jeans that I'm wearing, I don't know how much people are getting paid for sewing them, so it might not have been a living wage. So maybe. Maybe my clothes have been getting a little raggedy lately and I don't have a lot to actually buy because there aren't cooperatives yet producing apparel. But, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm seriously going to do this and have a meeting about it in two weeks. I'm going to try to get as many people as I can to commit to spending $300 or a certain amount of money at worker-owned apparel cooperatives in the Bay Area because there's a lot of new apparel companies. They're just not... They're just getting off the ground. They're not sure how to structure. And so they're meeting about how they can function as cooperatives. I'm kind of operating on the other end of it, the consumer end, saying, I'm going to organize support to make sure that you're successful. So that's my personal project. But I know there's a, an apparel company here locally called Petit Pelou or something like that, Molly. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's very exciting. Maybe people could organize and commit to um, spending a certain amount of money if she adds a line of shirts in addition to infant pants and shorts. 
Um, anyways, oh, by the way, you know, what, what, do you, what do you call it when you basically create a local economy and are able to have your dollar pass from a local store to a local manufacturer to a local designer, a local textile manufacturer? It is anything for a joke, uh, pun, I guess. Oh, my closed loop economy. Get it? Okay. Anyways, um, well, here's another game. I I'm obviously like, I like games. Uh, you could walk around town and look at every business and think, could that be a cooperative? Yes. Um, in fact, I've started thinking about this uh, with a lot of businesses. And it's, it's really hard for me to find a business that couldn't be a cooperative or shouldn't be a cooperative. Um, fancy restaurants are not usually cooperatives, but they could be. Local manufacturing definitely could be. Uh, even video stores. I was going to give a little rant about my local video store, but I'm going to cut this part out because I know we don't you know, have as much time. Um, but in any case, I would like lots of businesses to convert to worker cooperatives. That is my goal for the world. And so again, we can harness our consumer power. The cooperative and its ability to convene people and to organize power could actually influence a lot of businesses to convert to worker cooperatives. And especially think about businesses where the owners are nearing retirement. Usually the exit is to have a larger company buy their company. And then you end up with big corporate conglomerates again. So, um, so giving them incentives to convert to worker cooperative would be a very powerful thing. Um, okay, yeah, and as a convener, the food cooperative can just organize general people power, maybe even ask the city council to adopt awesome uh, ordinances that prioritize cooperative development. This is one of the projects my organization is working on right now is a model city ordinance for Oakland, but we'll share it widely, basically to get every city to commit to supporting cooperative development. Um, so a food cooperative is also an educational hub. Uh, it's where uh, probably most people first learn about cooperatives and what they are, and you have the opportunity to reach a lot of people, teach them about cooperatives and what does it mean to be a co-op owner, and um, yeah, just generally grow cooperative literacy in society. That is just a huge piece of this puzzle. The food cooperative can also be kind of a research hub, and the reason is, compared to other cooperatives and many other local businesses, you connect with a lot of people. You interact with so many people. You have a large membership, a diverse membership, because and the members come a lot because it's food and they eat a lot. So you have an opportunity to learn a lot about your local economy through your connections with the member owners and by asking them, well, what do you, what is it that you need? What should we be growing in our local economy? What can we? have be part of our homegrown economy. And, um, and you know everybody can think of themselves now as playing a pinball game. Where are you spending your dollars? Are they bouncing around within the community? Are they leaving? Uh, there's definitely a lot of things that we just can't get unless we go support big companies. Um, uh, because those things are not available. And it's hard for me to even know, like, where do I go get t-shirts that are locally made? And um, but anyways, knowing these things about your local economy can let you know where are the key leverage points, where are the opportunities we can begin to grow local industry. And who knows, you might be selling local clothing here at some point, or it might be a separate cooperative. And um, Oh, I also just spoke to another member, Vivian, who's kind of organizing people interested in health cooperatives. And so that's a really powerful thing that kind of shows me how amazing a food cooperative is as far as convening people and generating ideas and sort of replicating cooperatives throughout the economy. Um, food cooperative is also a physical hub, and I think it'll be even more so when you have more space. Um, I didn't know what 100 Bridge Street was going to look like. A little like that. But, um, <laughs> but in any case, um, as a physical hub, it gives you the opportunity to enable all kinds of sharing and shared resources. Car sharing cooperatives could be uh, easily managed at a physical hub like a food cooperative. Uh, it, it also becomes an anchor business for, for other cool businesses, people who tend to take part in food cooperatives might also use a tool lending library uh, or a seed library or something. So. Finally, food cooperative as uh, an investor, because you have reserved dollars. And I noticed you have a cooperative bank here, so that's great. But in general, like a lot of even nonprofits, cooperatives don't really think about where their dollar is sleeping at night. And if their dollar is 
bouncing around Wall Street, it's basically supporting fossil fuel industries and fast food and all kinds of things that are not benefiting us and not feeling very good about it. So of course you know where your dollar wants to be. Uh, invested locally, there are a lot of barriers of course to uh, investing locally and this is something my organization works a lot on um, is reforming securities laws to make it more possible. Uh, but it's a very powerful thing where you've invested your reserves. So that's, that's another, another way in which cooperatives are powerful. So I've listed six things. Actually, it'd be fun to talk, you know, maybe at the after party or <laughs> any time in the lobby. What, other, what are all the ways, maybe it'd be fun to like, put together an article, what are all the ways in which cooperatives have power beyond just being grocery stores um, to really influence how the local economy plays out? Because here's the thing about the economy is it feels like something that just kind of happens to us. We're kind of watching and waiting to see what happens on Wall Street and we all feel very vulnerable. It really affects us. Um, it's like we're just waiting for it to come crashing down the next time. Um, but that's a very passive perspective on the economy when I, I realize we don't have to have that perspective at all because we are the economy. We are, all, we are the majority of producers and consumers. Uh, we have a lot of power as con consumers especially to really influence what the economy looks like. So, so I think we can all basically see ourselves as pro protagonists in creating the next economy. And a food cooperative, if it chooses to do so, could actually see itself as a main protagonist, as a real power hub. Um, and there you go. I drew some of these car cartoons just this afternoon after going in and taking pictures and learning about everything you do. And I have to say, it's really inspiring. And the 90 hours a week that you commit to uh, supporting the local economy and growing the cooperative movement, that's, that is just inspiring. And, and you, you and this region are such a model. And I have to say, the rest of the world is watching um, and learning from what you're doing. So thank you for what you're doing. And um, real quick, before I forget, because I don't know when else to say it, uh, I brought a couple of my books, and I'm donating to the lending library that's in the front of the store. So this one's a kind of a do-it-yourself guide to sharing. And for people, you don't have to be a lawyer, but anybody who's interested in the whole legal realm of the new economy, um, this is my law book. So um, yeah, so thank you again for having me. I'm really grateful to be here and look forward to meeting some of you and talking afterwards. Thanks.